What is up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Dentsu Invest podcast, episode number 69, if I'm not mistaken. You'll also notice that there's a new intro for the podcast. I am, hmm, I'm a little bit in two minds about it. I think it's an improvement from the old one, but I don't know if it's the definitive edition. So I'd like everybody to reach out to me about that. Give me your thoughts, give me your feedback, give me your honest opinion so I know if I need to change it or if I need to create something else. This episode is talking about trusts and I am sat opposite a well-known CFA on the group called Rohit Rohella and he is here to educate us on trusts. Rohit, how are you? Hello, I'm very good, James. And how are you? I am 10 out of 10, mate. I'm a happy chappy. I'm pleased to be here and I'm excited to learn more about trust because I've heard of trusts, but that's about it, really. So I'm hoping that you can enlighten us because I know that they tend to come in useful when somebody has significant assets and they are planning to hand them on so to their 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 spouses, their next of kin, their kids, their family, unless I've got the wrong end of the stick, Rohit. But that's what, of course, you're here today to educate us on. So maybe it might be nice just to start off by telling us a little bit about trusts and what they are. Start from the bottom up, simple terms, zero jargon, because remember, a lot of people listening to this podcast will be just like me. They'll have heard of trusts and that's about it. You know, James, you hit it right, hit the nail right on the head. I'm a big proponent of keep things simple, right? So that's what we're going to do today. Now, uh, the clue is right there in the word, trust, yeah? So a trust is just an entity that you're putting assets into and whoever runs it for you, you're able to trust that person to manage it effectively for the benefit of other people you love and care for. And those are called the beneficiaries. So there are three entities in a trust. There's the settlor who gifts assets into the trust or puts assets into the trust. Then there is the trustee or the trustees who manage the assets for the benefit of the third entity, which is the beneficiaries. So the people that ultimately are designated to benefit from the assets of the trust. That is the basic concept. Now, there is a saying about trusts that if you don't trust your beneficiaries, then you put your assets into the trust. That may well be true. And there are certain instances which we'll come to, which illustrate why that may be the case. But the overarching need is what I just stated, shielding your assets from being withered away over time and also protecting them from tax. That is another reason to plan for it. But there are many others. There are many other reasons for it, which also covers your objectives, your long-term objectives for your money. So we'll talk about that as we go further into the discussion. Absolutely. And when you say there's other types, are we talking thousands or maybe it might be nice just to give us a little bit of a breakdown into the most common yeah. types there are out there? Yep. So I would break it down into two categories. One is trust planning for individuals and the other one is trust planning for businesses. OK, so we're going to talk about these two. Uh, first, we can start with individual trusts. Now, within the individual segment, there is trust for inheritance tax planning and there are trusts for pension planning. So uh, the most basic type of trust, which almost everyone knows about, is uh, a life insurance based trust. So when you take out life insurance, what the life insurance company is giving you is an assurance that if you pass away during the term of that policy, it will pay out your next of kin, your family or your chosen beneficiary, a certain sum of money. Um, so that sum of money, let's call it £100,000, for example, would go tax-free to the beneficiary. Now, let's take an example. If Mr. dies and the policy pays out, say, 100000 to Mrs. So that money has gone tax-free to the Mrs. But when Mrs. goes and the children get that money, it will be subject to an inheritance tax of 40%. To prevent that from happening, what we recommend, and any uh, reasonable person should take out, you know, if they're taking out life insurance, a trust. So what that trust does is it gets the assets when the policy pays out on debt, and the beneficiary, i.e. the missus in this case, can still get the money, but that will be a loan from the trust. So when she passes away and the children get that money, it is then repayable back from her estate to the trust. So there is no inheritance tax liability on it. So that gives you a clue as to how trusts are used for inheritance tax mitigation. 
they are essentially separate from the individual's estate. And as such, the assets that pass from one generation to the other and closed in a trust or wrapped around in a trust will be exempt from inheritance tax. Obviously, there are conditions which we'll talk about, but that's the basic premise of a trust. Does that give you a basic insight into who, what they are? Totally. So is it fair to say they're mainly for succession planning? Yes, for individuals, succession planning and yeah. transfer of wealth without incurring tax. So they are also used in conjunction with pensions in the same way as insurance. So I'll give you another example. Let's say uh, we're talking about Mr. Miggins, who is 55 or 60 years old, has now come up to retirement. Uh, he starts taking the benefits from his pension, but he chooses drawdown. So he doesn't take all the benefits in one go. He chooses to phase it throughout his lifetime. Now, what happens when Mr. Miggins passes away? Do you know? No? I'm not sure. Okay, so Mr. Miggins, if he's uh, wiser than you and me, then he would have designated somebody that he loves, we hope that is his wife and children, as the nominee, as the beneficiary nominated in the pension. So let's say it's Mrs. Miggins, for example. She gets the money in the pension and then she passes away. So what do you think is going to happen to, to that pension money which went to Mrs. Miggins and before it goes to the children, what's going to happen to it? We just touch upon it. Tax. Absolutely. The dreaded word inheritance tax. So that would apply. So say there was 100,000 in the pension, 40,000 of that money will disappear in tax when the money passes from Mrs. Miggins to their children. To prevent that from happening, what do you do? Again, the same principle as the life insurance. You set up something called an asset preservation trust. So the pension money goes into the trust. Mrs. Miggins is able to take a loan from the trust to fund her income and capital needs. On her death, when her property and other assets are sold, the loan is paid back to the trust. So it actually reduces her estate for inheritance tax purposes. And it keeps the original capital that was there in the pension also free of inheritance tax. And there's another important thing to note here. It's not just the original capital, it's the growth. OK, so you can invest in anything you like, pretty much that's permissible, which includes investment funds that put money into the great companies of the world, which will generate growth for you over time. Uh, you can expect anywhere from around five to eight uh, percent growth. So the assets will grow far beyond your lifetime and they will pass on free of inheritance tax up to 125 years. So it can be multi-generational vehicle for passing on wealth. I see. You know what, when I'm listening to all of this, it all sounds really great. And I'm thinking to myself, is there a catch? What's the downside? Well, the downside is that you have lost access to the capital. Okay. So once you've put the money into a trust, <clears throat> assuming you're doing planning for your own estate, the reason why people would choose to put money into a trust is because they want that money to pass away uh, or pass down the generations. However, the good news is that there are innovations in trusts, just as there are innovations in many other fields. So the innovations in trusts have meant that there are variants of a standalone trust, if you like, the basic vanilla trust. There are other variants that can give you access to capital or income from the trust. So uh, when we go into more detail, I'll cover each of those trusts with you. But essentially, that's uh, that, that's what is possible. You can tailor, you can uh, sort of tinker the trust to get what you want. And that's why it's not something which you can pick off the shelf. You need to speak to an expert financial advisor or consultant who can look at your situation and advise you on what's the right mix of trust to choose. You know what? I actually think now is a good opportunity to go into those further types of trust because later on we'll be talking yep. about who needs a trust, when do we use it, et cetera, et cetera. So whilst we're on the topic, maybe that might be where we take things next. Yeah, sure, let's do that. So let's talk about inheritance tax planning. So for that, I'm going to take the example again of Mr. and Mrs. Miggins. Let's say they've got a house, savings and other assets worth 1.2 million pounds, okay? And they've got two lovely children who have been real, who've been very good, very well-behaved, so they want to give their assets to their children after they pass away. Now, everybody in the UK gets 
a nil rate band, which means up to that extent, their estate is not going to be chargeable to inheritance tax, and that is three hundred and twenty-five thousand pounds. So between Mister and Missus, that combines or adds up to six hundred and fifty thousand. What the government also gives you is something called the residence nil rate band, which means if Mister and Missus Miggins are passing on their main home to the children, then they get an additional one hundred and seventy-five thousand pounds per person. So you add all of this together, six fifty plus three fifty. Is a million pounds. So what you've got there is uh, anything over a million pounds is going to be taxed at forty percent. So we have said that their estate is worth one million and two hundred thousand, one point two million. So on that two hundred thousand, they are going to pay forty percent inheritance tax, which is eighty thousand pounds. So eighty thousand pounds of their hard-earned money on which they've paid income tax, capital gains tax, is now again going to be taxed at forty percent. How do you think they'll feel about it? Not great. That's a lot, a big chunk, a big whack gone. Yeah, absolutely. So let's say that they tell uh, me, their advisor, it's going to be me, isn't it? <laughs> any any advisor they go to, okay, that uh, we want to save that eighty thousand pounds in inheritance tax, and we are happy to give away this two hundred thousand pounds to our children. So what I tell them is, if you give that money. To your children direct, say they give you hundred thousand to each child, and that child was to go away with that money and blow it up, you know, gambling, buying a nice car, whatever. Uh, then they would have effectively wasted it away, right? So instead, what we do is we put that money into a trust, so they can continue to be the trustee of that trust with their children as the beneficiaries. So what it does for them is, after seven years of making the gift, that's the rules uh, that the government has set. After seven years, that gift they've made is fully outside of their estate. So they've saved eighty thousand pounds in tax by gifting that money to a trust. Now that trust can be managed professionally, which we do. It can be put into investments, uh, which means it will grow by about five to eight percent. So if they have done it when they are say sixty and they live to ninety. You could expect that money, that hundred thousand, to grow to about five hundred thousand or more, and all that goes tax-free to the children. So that's the most basic type of trust that that normally uh, is good for people who don't want income, don't want capital, want a vehicle for uh, for wealth transfer. Now, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Miggins haven't got that much money, and uh, they think they want to get some income from the trust as well. So what they do to get the income is they take out a special type of trust, which is called the discounted gift trust. That gives them access to five percent tax deferred income. So essentially, income without paying any tax, at five percent of what they're putting in. So say they are putting in two hundred thousand into the trust, they can take ten thousand, which is five percent of two hundred thousand, as income for the rest of their lives without paying any tax on it. And that's the power of this special type of trust. Now, that's not all. With this type of trust, you get a discount for inheritance tax purposes. So that discount varies on your health, uh, on your age. So essentially, what HMRC allows us to do is to estimate how long the donor, so in this case, Mr. Miggin, Mr. Mrs. Miggins, are expected to live. And based on that figure, they get a discount for inheritance tax purposes on day one. Okay. Now this discount could vary from thirty to fifty percent. Uh, it could be lower for if your life expectancy is low and you've got an illness. But for most people, assuming they are in reasonably good health, they're in their sixties, seventies, they can get up to fifty percent or more discount. Which means, if let's say in this case the discount was fifty percent, so they would have saved inheritance tax on hundred thousand pounds straight away, and the remainder would go away in the next uh, seven years. So these are the two primary types of trusts which are used by people who are either looking to gift everything away, or those that are happy to give the capital but need the income from the trust. But there's a third type as well. I'm not done with this yet. There's a third type. Now that is for people who are selfish, who don't like giving things away. Right? Sounds like you and me. <laughs> we are lovely. Oh, speak, <laughs> speak for yourself. Speak for yourself, man. I live to give. I live to give. You live to give. That's that's my mission as well. So that, that's fantastic. 
we give away knowledge, we give away love, don't we? So absolutely, that's, that's absolutely. And you know what? Here's the thing. Here's the thing about the internet. You give out love, you give out knowledge, yeah. and it makes yeah. its way back to you because you're leveraging your love and knowledge with content. Yeah. And that's an interesting way of looking at the internet. Anyway, we digress. Yeah, no, that's it. Absolutely. The internet and the democratization of knowledge uh, and sharing of knowledge, advice, it's amazing. I love it. So there's a third type of trust for people who do not want to let go of their capital, but they say that any growth on it, that's fine. I will leave that for my children. Okay. Wow. That is called a gift and loan trust. So it's, it's really a clever concept if you think about it. So you're making a loan to the trust of your capital. Okay. So say you want, you're giving away in this case, 200,000. So you give 200, sorry, 100,000 as a loan, which you can get back from the trust. And the other 100,000 is a gift. So Mr. Miggins, Mrs. Miggins have said, let's keep 100,000 for ourselves and let's put the other 100,000 in the trust. So you can have a combination. But the beauty of this is the growth part on the whole 200,000 will be exempt from inheritance tax on day one. So this is a great solution for people who want to save inheritance tax, but do not feel ready to give away everything they got. They want to do it in stages, okay? So you can change the loan to a gift later on if you don't think you need that money. So it gives you that flexibility. So these are the three primary types of trusts. The first one being a standalone vanilla gift trust. So you gift away everything, that's it. You have a discounted gift trust that gives you 5% of your initial assets as income for the rest of your life. And you have the gift and loan trust where you can gift a part uh, to the trust and the other can be a loan to the trust. So you can get a hands, your hands on that money whenever you want. So these are the three primary trusts for inheritance tax planning. So hopefully that has shed some light on what you wanted to cover today. Totally, man. Totally. And then I would imagine within those three types, it mm -hmm. gets even more detailed. And maybe that's where you want to get an FA involved, I'm guessing. Absolutely. Well, I've just given you simple explanations, but how they work and how they fit with your individual planning is the real key here. And right. that needs someone with in-depth expertise on all of these trusts and other vehicles to design a strategy which uses all of these tools to the effect that you want. Your need, income needs, your capital needs, and your desires to pass on wealth. These are the three variables we look at and put together a bespoke strategy for you. So who amongst us in the audience should be considering a trust? What is your typical profile of a customer or an individual who is seeking a trust or you may recommend a trust towards or is there one? Yeah, so as I say, um, trusts have different applications. If we talk about the use of trust for life insurance or a pension, literally everybody should be setting it up because you don't want uh, your life insurance proceeds or your pension money to be taxed at 40% at some later stage. Uh, but specifically for gifting assets into the trust, uh, people that you know who have estates above the nil rate band thresholds so for a single person that is 500,000 pounds, if you include the residence nil rate band or 325,000 pounds otherwise, and you times that by two, so say a million pounds for a married couple. Uh, if your assets are over that, then you should really be looking at that earlier, sooner rather than later. There's also another category of people uh, who this is very relevant for, people that are running their own businesses. So we talk about dentists who are running their practices, et cetera. So the government gives you a very valuable relief called business property relief, or now the name has changed to just business relief. So uh, the concept behind it is, let's say if you were running a dental practice, James, and you passed away um, and the practice then went to your children, there wouldn't be any inheritance tax. Okay. So business assets are exempt from inheritance tax. However, uh, I don't know any dentist or any business owner, for example, uh, who wants to run their business till they drop dead, right? At some stage, they're looking for an exit plan. And the moment they exit the business, they get the cash in their account. That money is liable to their personal inheritance tax. So you, the good news is, is if you act timely, you can invest in assets which are exempt from inheritance tax, and those also qualify for business relief. So that strategy is really good for people who are selling businesses. They are a very common category of people. We come across and we help with this sort of planning. So anybody that has got assets, uh, 
already exceeding 1 million for a married couple or 500,000 for a single person, or they're worried that they might be breaching that threshold. That's for inheritance tax, almost anyone for pensions and life insurance, and people who are selling businesses. These are the primary applications that we normally come across of trusts. Got you. What about any specific instances for dentists that you've noticed are recurring? Is there any applications to the dental field that you've came across or you commonly find? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, the most common example I come across is uh, dental practice owners who are looking to sell their practices effectively. They're looking for an exit plan. So uh, they're going to all of a sudden get uh, perhaps hundreds of thousands or a few millions uh, for their practices. They've done very well, hopefully. And they're really worried about uh, 40% of that disappearing in tax when they're gone. So that is the segment where which we see the most often. But there's also another uh, sort of application on the business side of things where uh, dentists who are looking to you know, so they've set up a set of practices, let's say they've set up their own business, uh, you know, dental surgery business, which is doing very well. And they really love it to bits because it's their baby. Now they've come to a point where they can't keep running it. They would like to slowly take their time away from it and face into their retirement, but they don't really want to sell it to someone they don't know uh, who may not treat their patients well. So there's another type of trust, which is relevant for these type of people. And that is the employee ownership trust. So with this trust, you can actually give the rights to run your practice to a set of your employees or associates. And over the next few years, you can take money out of your practice in a more tax efficient way. That also gives you control over how the business is run for a few more years. And you can see it go through an orderly transition. Also, you can extract your, uh, your money from the business in a tax efficient way. Uh, it's way more tax efficient than selling it straight away and, and taking all the proceeds. You get hit with uh, you know, 10% up to 1 million, that's entrepreneur's relief. And then the excess gets taxed at 20%. So that you know, trust route could be something that uh, dentists might take advantage of in that situation. Yeah, that's interesting. You know, when I hear you talking about trusts, Mm -hmm. From the picture that you're painting and from what I gather, it sounds like virtually everybody should think about stashing their money in some form of trust. But I, I'm not sure that's the actual case in reality. For me, it seems like something that is not that common. What is the answer? What is your answer on that one? Is it is it common in your experience? Is it more common than I think? Or do you feel like there should be more of an uptake of these? Yeah. So I think the biggest barrier to the use of trust is knowledge. And that's what we're hoping, hopefully taking a small step okay. towards changing. Uh, but it's also uh, the actual cash available, the spare cash available that people have. So when uh, you're typically younger and you're just sort of building up your um, investment portfolio, your assets, that at that stage, maybe the only trust relevant to you is the life insurance based trust, where you take out life insurance to protect your family, and you uh, set up a trust so that the proceeds go into that. Uh, but as you build your assets, uh, the second thing to look at is your pension. So almost everybody has a pension. Uh, if not, they should be really thinking why not. And then um, if, if they're doing reasonably well as a dentist, chances are that they would have a private pension if that's something they're looking into. Uh, have, they, they would have a private pension with a few hundred thousand pounds in there by the time they're in their 40s or 50s, that's typically when uh, trust planning becomes really important. So we see most of our clients over the age of 45 or 50 uh, who really start thinking about using trust because they're worried about uh, inheritance tax. They've bought properties which have risen in value. Uh, they have grown their dental businesses. They have built up nice pensions and they want, don't want to be a victim of their own success. So that's what we help them do. Preserve their wealth and grow it. I hear you. I hear you. You know, I once heard somebody say, I can't remember, maybe it was you or maybe it was someone else. And they said, you know, people who fail to plan for succession love the tax man yeah. more than they love their own kids because that's how much of their own wealth they give away. Have you heard that one? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Was um, that one of yours? I, I, 
No, no, no. That is one of the uh, chan- ex chancellors that we've had. Oh, but it, uh, I can't remember the name offhand now. But it's it's true. It's true. So uh, th- there are several examples, right, which tell you why straightforward gifting is not the right thing because that's what comes to people's minds very often. Uh, look, we love our children. We trust our children. Why can't we just give them money straight away? Uh, you can, but there are potential downsides. Uh, I'll give you a very interesting statistic first to ponder about. And then uh, I'll invite you to think why that may be the case, okay? So for some strange reason, divorce rates really spike when one of the spouses gets a windfall inheritance. Uh, It's funny, isn't it? Uh, You might wonder why that might be. And and that really tells you something, okay? So the divorce rate in this country is is 50%, close to 50%, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Uh, So if you're a parent, looking at your children and you know you want to help them say step onto the property ladder or get nice education or whatever it might be uh, but are you aware have you thought through that if they were to get into a bad marriage and uh, it resulted in a divorce that rogue spouse could walk away with 50 percent of your hard-earned assets which you've given away it's a real issue that So that's another very important reason. It's not just tax, it's actually keeping control over the assets, okay? Um, There's another very common example which I cite. Let's say you're doing inheritance tax planning and you've got an 18 year old. Uh, You give them 100,000 pounds. What do you think they're gonna do with it? What would you have done with it if you were 18 and you got given 100,000 pounds? (laughs) Yeah. You're gonna have some fun, come on. Go on, aren't you? Yeah. Exactly. You know, you would just buy an expensive car, blow it on a holiday. Well, uh, that, that's at least what I would have done. They may be more wise, you know, wiser 18-year-olds these days. We don't know. <laughs> but by putting that money in a trust, it's still there for them. But then you've got control as the trustee. You can appoint other trusted people like your, you know, brother, sisters, friends, as the trustees there as well. So they can control the assets and give what is required at the right time, the right uh, amount to the children. And the important thing is that the assets of the trust must keep growing, okay? Because we we know the figures for inflation have come out 6.2%. And if your assets are not growing at that pace, then you're losing their value. So we make sure that the underlying investments of the trust are growing. So in the next segment, uh, when we go in there, I will talk about that investment strategy and how we ensure trust grow in real terms as well. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. We can, we can even do that right now if you want to. I'm yeah, totally happy absolutely. for you to mention briefly how yeah, that's I done. Wasn't sure. I wasn't sure if you wanted to ask me any yeah, other questions. Well, yeah. Well, what we could do is, I mean, that sounds like a nice thing to go into next because there's still a lot of mystery out there as yeah. to how growing your money works, whether that's in a trust, whether that's in an ISA or in a SIP. We're, yeah. we're moving a little bit beyond the trust now and we're talking yeah. about investing, aren't we? And the mechanisms yeah. behind that. But effectively what you're doing... Yeah. The, the, the essence of this story we'll keep it we'll keep it as focused as focused as possible on trusts because yeah. i think what we're about to talk about is probably a whole entire other podcast in itself if we want to do it yeah. justice but the principle is you invest in the world yeah. economy which only ever goes up over long enough periods of time and you diversify throughout the great companies of the world yeah. maybe if you want you chuck some bonds in there as well if you want to get a little defensive People, yep. there is a philosophy that you go 100% equities where you can, if you're going to be in the market for over five years. Again, mm-hmm. you can already see how we're going down a whole uh, rabbit hole right here in itself. But the principle yeah. is, the long story short, I'm guessing what you're about to say is you diversify throughout the economy of the world and you spread yourself enough so that you're not exposed, overexposed to any individual risk from a company going bust. Yeah, essentially that. But there are some nuances to it, which oh I will okay oh I'm all ears then in that case yeah or trust. So <clears throat> let's just touch upon one trust which we all have, and that is a pension. Okay, a pension is set up typically as a master trust arrangement. So every pension scheme uh, has a trustee. Even the NHS pension scheme has a group of trustees, and their responsibility is to run the manage the pension assets or invest the pension assets in a way that they can meet future liabilities of the scheme, which is paying out pensions to all of the uh, members of that scheme. So that is 
a type of trust which we all come across. But if we have a private pension, then effectively uh, we take a lot more control over how the assets are invested. The same logic applies to a trust created for the purposes of inheritance tax planning. So uh, what we do is we use typically a, an investment structure called an investment bond, which is held in the trust. Okay, And we break that down into segments. So think of it as buckets. Okay, And when uh, your beneficiary needs some money, you calculate how many buckets need to be taken out of the trust and given to the beneficiary. So if we take the earlier example where we had 100,000 pounds, we might break that down into 100 buckets of 1,000 pounds each. Okay, And when um, any, any part of that is needed, let's say, um, you know, my, you know, I, I've made that, or Mr. Miggins has made that gift, and the son needs 10,000 pounds. So you take 10 buckets out of the 100 that you created, and you give uh, those 10 buckets to the beneficiary. Uh, the beauty of it is, because it gets paid out straight from the trust to the beneficiary, there is no tax applicable on the trust itself. It's the beneficiary who then gets the money tax-free as well. So these are the two main benefits of, of, of the trust, okay? Now, there is also uh, another very uh, beautiful application of trust, and that is where the gift that is being made into the trust is over the nil rate band. Because if you're making the gift into a trust over the amount of 325,000, that is the nil rate band I mentioned to you, then there may be inheritance tax, lifetime inheritance tax applicable of 20% on it. To get around that problem, you can invest into business property relief qualifying investments, BPR investments. Now, they are a very special category of investments which get special treatment from the government in that they are zero rated for inheritance tax. These are investments typically in lending. So uh, lending for housing developments, commercial property, things like that. They can be investments into renewable energy. So think of the uh, climate crisis, think of what's going on in Ukraine. The government is really keen for renewable energy to be invested in. And as a result, it makes those investments free of inheritance tax. And uh, thirdly, it can be investments into uh, the AIM market. So not all, but many AIM companies will qualify for BPR or business relief, which means they're exempt from inheritance. So we source investments like that to invest into as part of a trust environment uh, if the gift in there exceeds the nil rate band. So uh, I know it's probably getting into a bit more nitty gritty, a bit more complexity, but it just tells you that there are a lot of decisions to be made about the investments underlying uh, or lying within the trust as well. So those can be invested into large cap companies, as you mentioned. So the likes of Tesco, Vodafone, Apple, you know, all the large companies, great companies of the world but it can also be invested into smaller companies, which are the Apples, Amazons, and Googles of tomorrow. So things like companies innovating in climate change, data science, um, artificial intelligence, the kind of companies which you get really excited about, James. You know yeah. what, that's really, that, when you said just a minute ago that there's some caveats to it, that is a really interesting caveat in itself because you're hugely incentivized to look at those smaller companies, just as you mentioned a minute ago. And I think, that just as you said, that's probably when we're getting into high level trust strategy, but certainly it's a little taster of the complexity that they have. Interesting stuff, my friend. Rohit, I sense you could talk a lot more on trusts, but you know what? This podcast is coming up to about 40 minutes now and we've encapsulated trusts very nicely, I feel, and how they work, at least on a superficial level to give everybody a little bit of an understanding. Any more complexity and we might run the risk of Talk, yeah. well too much information yeah. let's say that too much yeah. information but Rohit we are as I say going to draw a line under this very shortly is there anything else that you'd like to say in conclusion on trusts yeah all I would say is uh, just like with everything else educate yourself read about them and if you need a helping hand in understanding anything I'm always there uh, seek advice from me or any other trusted professional uh, and take informed decisions take it timely make it wisely, and then you will achieve really good outcomes, uh, whether it comes to trust or investing or anything else in life. I love it. I love it, my friend. So if anybody is interested by what Rohit said today, feel free to reach out to Rohit on the group. Rohit Rahela, you'll be able to find him in the members section, and you do pop up 
on the questions that appear there from time to time. So if anybody would like to know more about trust, feel free to reach out to Rohit. Rohit, you've been very generous with your time today. Thank you so much for coming on the show. We will catch up super soon. We'll see you later. Thank you, James. It's been a pleasure as always. See you soon. Cheers. Cheers, my friend. Bye-bye.